this morning, as an overview, I'm going to go into a quick account of what vitamin C has been documented already to do. Uh, I talked about yesterday the foundations of all disease being uh, oxidation and increased oxidative stress. And then I'm going to go from what vitamin C has been documented to do to some of the new things it's done and some of the things that I think we can expect it to do in the future. So I hope this gives you a, a little bit better of a handle on the incredible therapeutic tool that's vitamin C. Uh, as before, the references, you they have numbers, go to PubMed for that. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but I want you to know that, uh, and this is just a sampling, understand, just a sampling. But in the literature, it's been well documented that in vivo, in the, in the test tube, vitamin C readily kills or inactivates, however you want to view it, uh, viruses, and in particular has been highly effective against the uh, polio virus, okay, even after it's been injected directly into the brains of some poor monkeys. Uh, similar for herpes virus, similar for vaccinia viruses, similar for enteroviruses, flu virus, uh, and, uh, and even rabies virus, okay? We don't have clinical studies of anybody with rabies being treated with vitamin C, mainly because it would probably be considered malpractice to take what's supposed to be a fatal disease and deprive them of the rabies vaccination. But in animal studies, it's been just as effective against rabies as any other virus. So that's a sampling of the test tube, the in vitro. The in vivo, inside the human being itself or the animal subject, Nothing stands out more starkly than the original work reported by Dr. Klenner uh, on polio. He was in the middle of a polio epidemic in Reedsville, North Carolina in 1948 and treated some 60 babies and children that came to him in the emergency room. Half of them were documented with spinal taps, so there's no question about the diagnosis. The other half were not given spinal taps because spinal taps were felt to be a factor in spreading the virus into the central nervous system. But in the middle of an epidemic when everybody's pouring in with the same symptoms, it's really not uh, an arguable point that Klenner was treating something other than polio. So giving injections to infants, usually intramuscular, uh, in three days, Klenner cured 57 out of 60. And the other three were cured too, they just required two more days. So 60 out of 60, higher mathematics, but still 100%. Point being is, you catch any virus early on and it's readily and easily curable. And I use that word inadvisably because it's true. It's just as damaging to say something cures something and that's not true as not to say it cures something when it does. Okay, so got to call a spade a spade. Um, Klenner reported on this in the AMA convention in Chicago the next year and was pretty much roundly ignored and the person that came after him was talking about improvements in the iron lung to help polio patients breathe and was received with rounding applause. So the BS in medicine has been going on for a long time. Uh, incredibly, Klenner also took a little girl, about nine or 10 years old, who had already had polio for two weeks and had absolute complete flaccid paralysis of her legs and he was able to cure her with intravenous vitamin C as well, except it took two weeks and not three to five days. Basically, the importance of, in a virus and vitamin C is how acute it is. If it's an acute viral syndrome, 
it's hard to find a situation or circumstance in which vitamin C won't cure it quickly and easily. It's only when the virus, shall we say, embeds in some of the subcellular organelles inside the cells and the access to the virus is not as easy as it is in an acute syndrome. Because remember, nothing is magic. Things only work when they co-apt and meet. They don't work if they're in the proximity of each other. So there has to be the biochemistry and the physical machinizations that allow molecules to contact each other if these cures are going to be affected. Interestingly, Dr. Kletter also demonstrated that if you used enough vitamin C orally, you could get the same results with polio as with uh, intravenous uh, and intramuscular. Acute hepatitis, I mean, I can't count the number of cases when I was an intern and resident, you'd see these people sick for months. And literally, when you give enough vitamin C, you take someone with massively elevated liver enzymes, severely ill, and you have them clinically well in a week. Okay, so uh, this has been documented a lot in the literature. Dr. Cathcart, uh, a member of the Orthomolecular Medicine Hall of Fame, a, a renowned vitamin C researcher, did a great deal and showed that it could all be done with oral. So one thing I want to emphasize just at this juncture is... Don't overlook, especially for some of your more indigent patients, the benefit of the cheap, okay? Vitamin C, ascorbic acid, sodium ascorbate, by itself, plain old powder, plain old pills, has cured so much disease and so much infection in the last 80 years, it's mind-numbing. Now, there are ways to do it more effectively, more efficiently, intravenous, liposome encapsulated, intramuscular, these sort of things. But don't overlook the value of just having somebody have a big bottle of vitamin C powder, and when they start to get sick, you just take a level teaspoon every hour until you're well or you poop your brains out, whichever comes first. That's Dr. Klenner's formula that he used for dealing with hepatitis. Very dramatically in the articles that Klenner wrote were the number of people that he brought out of coma who had viral encephalitis. Uh, and believe me, when you're in coma from viral encephalitis, you're only a few hours to a few days away from death. Okay, but nevertheless, and at least the ones he reported on, I don't know if he had cases he was unable to say, but I assume that if you reach any patient who's too far gone, vitamin C and nothing else is going to bring them back. But if you get somebody that's still a ways from death's doorstep, you can bring them back as long as no severe secondary damage has already taken place. Uh, this is always great to have a good demonstration of what vitamin C does. It's good for your patients to see it. And if you haven't seen it, it's good for you to see it. Okay. This was in 2009 in New Zealand. New Zealand has a 60 minutes program just like the United States does. Okay. This uh, <clears throat> farmer... Uh, on vacation, came back with the swine flu, went into the hospital, quickly, relatively quickly, slipped into a coma, whited out his lungs, got ready to have his life support discontinued. <laughs> his family said no. This is interesting to me because I've never gotten more credit for doing less in my life. The role that I played in this was a cousin of the patient emailed me and said, described the situation, and said, do you think high-dose vitamin C will help? I said, sure, give it to him. That was my involvement. 
And the family was just bulldog. It's a long story. They went to court, this out of the other, but they got him high dose vitamin C, 50 grams twice a day. Quickly his whited out lungs came back. <clears throat> And then the evil physicians dropped the dose from 50 grams twice a day to one gram twice a day. Now, why would you do that unless you wanted a patient to die while still taking vitamin C so you could say vitamin C was worthless? But as it turns out, the little joke's on them because of two things. I'm going to talk about this later on. It now turns out that giving much lower doses of vitamin C more frequently can have as good or better effect than extremely large doses. And number two, the family was able to get the tube taken out and they started, started them on six grams a day of the live on liposome encapsulated vitamin C. So the doctors missed their chance to kill the patient. Pretty much all acute viral Syndromes have been cured by vitamin C, measles, mumps, acute herpes, okay? Some of the chronic forms will respond well, some of them won't. You know, I get a lot of emails on that, and I just say, well, you got to try it and see how it, see how it works. I've had a number of patients that have, let's say, reported fever blisters in the past. Then they get an IV vitamin C, and the next day, Two things happen. They start popping out a new fever blister, and their breasts hurt like crazy the whole night, which basically tells me that there was a load of virus in the ganglions, caused an eruption, and then the drainage into the breast caused a severe burning, and then several days of that, and it resolves it. I can't give you a percentage on that. I can't tell you how many times it's going to happen out of 10, but I just offer that as an evaluation and insight. Also documented e efficacy in non-viral infections. Um, bactericidal, fungal. Fungal responds well, it just takes longer. Okay, they grow slower. And very interesting, look at these four. Malaria, leprosy, dysentery, trypanosomes. Well, number one and number three. It's very effective with malaria. It's very effective with dysentery. Now, if you want to just look at those two diseases and nothing else, and think about the number of people that die from those conditions every year around the world, that by itself would be a mind-numbing contribution for vitamin C if it did nothing else. Now, there's a lot of different mechanisms with viruses, cancers, uh, other disease cells by which vitamin C, shall we say, works its magic. Uh, however, we often, or I find it's often forgotten that vitamin C is your I think very clearly your strongest, most powerful, nonspecific stimulant and supporter of the immune system. Basically, we know, for example, that monocytes have 80-fold, 8,000% more vitamin C inside them than the surrounding cells. And monocytes are the first cell to show up at the site of new inflammation. And what is always present at a new site of inflammation? A depletion of antioxidants, a near absence of vitamin C. I would submit to you, and this is opinion, I'm not presenting it as fact, I would present to you that the primary role of the immune system is to bring vitamin C and antioxidant capacity to the site of inflammation. Meaning vitamin C is the primary fuel or the bullets in the immune system gun, if you will, that makes the immune system either powerful, moderately strong, or weak, 
all depends on its content of vitamin C in the immune cells being summoned to the site of acute infection and or inflammation. And what, is docu what has vitamin C been documented to do? Documented, increased interferon, enhanced phagocytosis, the concentration of the white blood cells, enhanced T cell response, enhanced B cell response, uh, enhanced T and B cell proliferation. Uh, look at number 11, enhanced antibody production and complement activity. I think vaccinations are a situation that can be improved greatly without getting into a horrible argument uh, and without parents going to jail and without kids being hurt by one intervention and one intervention only. Give large amounts of vitamin C before and after the vaccination. In old people, young people, I guarantee you it's going to knock out well over 95% of any potential negative impact, and it can be quote unquote legitimately sold to all pro vaccine individuals, the pharmacists, the pediatricians, the internists, with one simple incontrovertible fact What's the purpose of a vaccination? Supposedly, to give you protection against a given disease or condition. How is that done? It's by stimulating a specific antibody response to a certain antigen. What stimulates that response? Vitamin C. So don't even get into the situation of whether or not a vaccination is indicated and just completely and totally otherwise disrupt your life. If you give enough vitamin C, you can make the case Nobody will tell you, even the most ardent pro-vaccinator, that any vaccination gives 100% protection against any disease. No, never is that, made, is that assertion made. It's going to be 20, 40, 60, 80% protection. Say, why not make it better with the most potent and the most harmless substance on the planet, vitamin C? So... Some food for thought there. <clears throat> the more the better, but if you wanna be just efficient and you have, I, I personally think with the tiny infants, I gave my little girl when she's two years old and she loved it, they make these super tiny little things of yogurt. I'd squeeze a packet in there, mix it up. You can, you can give a half to a whole packet of the liposome C to an infant at any age, do one before and one after. If you have the time or the inclination, do one a day for a week and one a day for a week after. The more the merrier. But I think my opinion is one good dose and one good dose before and one good dose after is going to do it. I say liposome because of two things. It's easy to take, especially for the young ones. It gets much more potent and gets inside the cells, but let's say for an older child and you don't have the liposome, sure, use vitamin C powder. The only downside with that is if it's ascorbic acid, it could upset the stomach, and with sodium ascorbate, uh, it can, it's salty, okay? So it'd have to be of a certain dilution. But several grams a day for a few days, and then the day of, and then several grams a day, day after. And same thing for the older people that have to get the, uh, or have to get, that frequently are led to believe they must have the, uh, the flu vaccinations, et cetera. Enhanced natural killer cell activity, and a host of other things. Now, also, and you could just tuck this away as your own knowledge, this 
can inflame the pro-vaccination people, but there's still no denying that whether or not you want to argue about what possible damage a vaccine can do, there's still no arguing that there's making no effort at all to take out the mercury and the other preservatives, contaminants, whatever you want to call them in a vaccine. And as it turns out, vitamin C is the prototypical and ideal antitoxin. And its documented abilities with toxins are arguably even more dramatic than its overwhelmingly dramatic effect on infections, especially viral. Look at this. It's been documented to deal with the toxicity of mercury, lead, chromium, arsenic, cadmium, nickel, vanadium, aluminum, fluorine, fluoride. Okay? Yesterday we talked why. Why? Because all toxins damage via increased oxidative stress and the theft of electrons from biomolecules, rendering them into an oxidized, inactive or severely reduced activity state. And when you restore those electrons, you bring function back. And when you encounter toxins like this before they get inside the tissues, and donate the electrons directly to the toxin, you basically quench it and eliminate its toxicity because it's no longer seeking more electrons. But you still need detoxification mechanisms because you need to get these things out of your body. Venoms, very dramatic. Alcohol, pretty dramatic, okay? No police in here, huh? I'm not, okay, I just, uh, it, it will, it will, get you out of an inebriated state fairly quickly, okay? But I can't guarantee you what the breathalyzer will show. You'll just be more clear-headed. Barbiturates, uh, toxic mushrooms. I tell you what, they had a, well, I'll just say it, a crazy Frenchman. <laughs> I actually said that in Paris, too, so I'm, I'm not just avoiding the French people, who, and they got a chuckle out of it as well. But this fellow named, uh, oh, I don't have the name, but he developed a little protocol of treating Amanita phylloides mushroom intoxication, which can kill you so quickly, uh, with uh, vitamin C, lipoic acid, and something else. And he actually got to the point where he would make presentations around France. And as part of his presentation, he'd take three times the fatal dose of mushrooms in front of everybody. And then take his antidote. I'm not going to do that. <laughs> but I'm pretty sure it'll work. Uh, as far as I know, he didn't die, so it worked. Pesticides, strychnine. Now, this is something that Ron and I have worked with intermittently for some time now with, with the benefits of vitamin C in chronic, deeply embedded, deeply seeded infections. Lyme, to a lesser degree AIDS, not much AIDS, chronic hepatitis. For lack of a better word, these are situations of diseases and chronic infections where the virus is hidden. The virus is just simply not readily accessible by the vitamin C or whatever other agent you're going to treat it with. Nevertheless, Lyme has been shown to be consistently is strongly improvable and often completely resolvable by, shall I say, persistent high-dose vitamin C. Uh, although the protocol we put together is a little different, designed to try to get the positive effect in a couple weeks rather than a couple months, uh, I've had the feedback from a physician treated about 14 or 15 Lyme patients and Based on what I had told them from this one person that reported back to me, uh, a nurse in North Carolina, Tennessee, 
And I had given a talk there, and hey, how can I remember what I say? I gave a talk there, and somewhere along the lines, I must have just said, you know, if you want vitamin C to be successful, you just got to keep at it, and you got to take a lot. I don't think it was pretty profound, but that's pretty much what I said. And one of the people in attendance, there were lay people as well as physicians, was a lady with Lyme. And I never intended this to happen, but she came back to that little facility and said, I want intravenous vitamin C every day. And basically, they came to agreement, so she started taking, I don't know if it was 50 or 100, it was at least 50, maybe 75 to 100 grams intravenously every day. And of course, that runs up into money for a lot of people. And the thing that got me nervous when I heard this story was she didn't get better at all for 22 days. And, but she still wanted to continue. And on the 23rd day, the nurse wrote me back and said, Dr. Levy, it was like a light switch went from off to on. After that 23rd infusion, she was fine, perfectly normal. And she said, let's make sure and continue them for one more week. And she can you continue for one more week. A month or two later, all the Lyme blood work was normal. Now, I'm not telling you that's going to happen every time. I, Lyme is still a big mystery, but I did have a physician that followed a similar pro protocol and said he got a similar result in 14 other patients, including the prolonged lack of improvement until the light switch went on. Uh, we, we still have a lot to learn about the pathology there, but I think it has to do with layering. You just keep at it and you get deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper for lack of a more elegant explanation. And then you finally reach the point where you reach the pathogen and you knock it out. Also, Lyme is unique in that uh, it's fueled by manganese and not iron. Okay, and it's a lot easier for vitamin C and other antioxidants to supply electrons to iron and initiate the Fenton reaction than apparently it is with manganese. And this, Dr. Yanagasawa can tell you a lot about, is the effects of vitamin C and radiation toxicity. Just remember, radiation toxicity is a mechanical form of oxidation. You're not taking a pro-oxidant substance, you're receiving pro-oxidants from the air. And they're just as or more reliably depleting your tissues and your biomolecules of electrons. And so it's all a matter of amount, how much is the damage, how much antioxidant repair is coming in that ultimately determines how positive a clinical re response you get to somebody who's had a significant radiation exposure. So, practical considerations on vitamin C. As I mentioned, it significantly enhances immune function, always. It has its own direct antipathogen properties, and this applies to pathogens as well as cancer cells. It will activate the Fenton reaction, rapidly increase intracellular or intrapathogen oxidative stress, and either cause apoptosis or frank necrosis and rupture of the pathogen or uh, cancer cell. It neutralizes toxins. And remember, all infections even if they don't produce specific endotoxins or exotoxins, everything else they produce is still an oxidized substance. An oxidized substance is a toxin because an oxidized substance is something that's depleted of electrons and looking to restore its electron load. Vitamin C, of course, repairs oxidized biomolecules Number five, very important, and it really slips between the cracks for a lot of people, is that 
This is especially important if you're having any sort of tete-a-tete -tete with a hospital committee or if somebody's trying to give you a hard time about using any form of vitamin C, much less intravenous inside the hospital, start checking vitamin C blood levels, okay? You don't even have to get into a conversation with a lunatic who doesn't want to understand anything to say, the laboratory shows a low vitamin C level. I'm just treating that level. I'm not trying to kill the infection. I'm not trying to kill the cancer cell. I'm not trying to make the person better. I'm just trying to make sure that we replete the vitamin C that's been depleted by the condition. So, chronic, chronic promoters of degenerative disease. Infections, number one, far and away. Dental, number one, far and away of the infections, okay? Uh, and uh, for those of you who don't have it, please get a copy of Hidden Epidemic. Uh, we have a conference special, only 10 cents. Okay, 10 cents. But you got to pay your 10 cents. I'm kidding. You can keep your 10 cents. And this goes into the importance of dental infections, the incredible prevalence of dental infections. The evidence in the literature shows that Roughly 10 to 15% of all adult teeth around the world are abscessed. One or more. That's all you need for heart attack, breast cancer, lupus, Alzheimer's, Lou Gehrig's, Parkinson's. All of those chronic degenerative disease share one thing chronically increased systemic body-wide oxidative stress, which is fueled by, more powerfully than anything else, chronic infection. Of course, outside toxic exposures, toxic iron. I don't know if you've never seen it. Go to YouTube, type in Dr. Levy iron video, and put on your seatbelt and have your vomit bag ready with you. Okay, because it's nauseating. But they've been doing it to our food since 1945, and they're putting metallic iron filings in your food. A lot of reasons for it, but no time for that now. Dietary toxin exposures, number five, super big. Super big. Hormone imbalances, I should say hormone deficiencies, I don't care how old you are, if you want to properly be treated or treat your patients and expect an optimal result, you need to get their testosterone slash estrogen levels in at least the low to mid range of normal. Same thing, even more importantly for thyroid function. Because we got lots of people with infections in their mouth that don't get heart attacks and they don't get cancer. But we have the evidence to show that they didn't because they had perfectly adjusted thyroid function. Regular thyroid function tests are worthless. All they are is misleading. All they can do is diagnose Hyperthyroidism, very effectively. Severe hypothyroidism, very effectively. And nothing else. And not the most important thing, which is minimal hypothyroidism. When you're minimally hypothyroid, you have increased oxidative stress throughout your body. Your deiodinase enzymes inside your cells are not functioning well because they're oxidized, remember oxidized biomolecules and enzymes don't function? Well, oxidized deiodinase enzymes that convert T4 to T3 are not functioning inside your cells. And 85% of the 
of T3 production, conversion from T4, takes place inside all the cells of your body, not inside the thyroid gland. So those tests are just looking at the thyroid gland and not evaluating the most important thing, which is thyroid function inside your cells. Dr. Ron can give you more detail, but you basically need a T3 to reverse T3 ratio of 18, 19, 20 to 1. And if it gets lower than that, you need to work on that because having that index of increased oxidative stress in your body is going to severely impede and impair anything else you want to accomplish. So treatment principles logically follow. You prevent new toxin exposure. My mentor, Dr. Huggins, some 25 years ago, when we were having a conversation and we, he was kind of humoring me at the time and tolerating my questions. And I don't know what it was I said about toxins, but he looked at me with an extremely impatient look and said, Tom, you can't dry off while you're still in the shower. And I don't think more profound words were ever said. That's, in a nutshell, the shortcoming of integrative medicine. The shortcoming of mainstream medicine is they ignore everything. They don't identify new toxins, and they don't repair old toxic damage. The shortcoming of integrative medicine is they only do one of those things. They try to repair old damage, but don't make a serious effort to identify the ongoing new toxins coming in. But you're never going to dry off while new water is getting you wet. And you're never going to resolve a clinical syndrome secondary to increase oxidative stress if you don't stop the new influx of Oxidation stress causing toxins. Number one, the mouth. And then you neutralize existing toxins, you excrete toxins in as non toxic a fashion as possible, resolve infections, supplement op optimally, and address hormone imbalance. Now, this might seem simple here, but very important. What is the goal of any? not only vitamin C protocol, but any effective treatment protocol for a positive clinical outcome. It's to optimize, improve, and make as normal as possible the redox status inside the cells. You want to have normal levels of intracellular oxidation. All disease, 100% of all disease, has increased oxidative stress inside the disease cells. No exceptions. Some diseases also involve some increased oxidative stress extracellularly, but the biggie is intracellular. So you want to get not just vitamin C, but you want to get the antioxidant capacity maximized inside the cells. Yesterday, we talked about mitochondrial dysfunction. And of course, the best way to get your mitochondria healthy is to get your cytoplasm healthy. It's really that simple. Big factors in the administration of vitamin C. We used to think, I used to think, I think Ron used to think, the ultimate factor was dose. If you didn't use enough, you didn't get it. The three most factors, important factors in vitamin C, dose, dose, and dose. The three most important factors in real estate, location, location, location. The three most important factors in French cooking, butter, butter, and butter. Okay. However, I think now the most, three most important factors in vitamin C administration are Frequency, frequency, and frequency. You appear to get much more bang for your buck taking overall smaller total amounts of vitamin C but divided into smaller doses given more frequently. 
But that's not to say if you have the time, the money, and the supplies, lots of vitamin C is not going to do the trick as well. But we have some dramatic data that I'll show you in a moment. You have root, oral, regular, liposome encapsulated, intravenous, intramuscular, and of course, the way to possibly turn your liver enzymes on to make your own rate, frequency, duration. With infectious diseases, don't stop your vitamin C the moment the person is clinically normal. You almost always relapse. You always continue the same elevated doses of vitamin C for at least 24 and preferably 48 hours after clinical normalcy. I've, I've been burned on this many times. Uh, I don't have time for all my little stories, okay. So, liposome encapsulated, rapidly absorbed because it's inside a fat it's liposome payload. It's protected against the stomach and the stomach is protected against it. So one doesn't aggravate the other. Possibly the most important part is liposomes of the proper size can allow access not only to the cytoplasm, but to the mitochondria, to the nucleus, to the other intracellular organelles, the payload, the vitamin C, or whatever else is encapsulated, can reach those sites without the consumption of energy. Comparing liposome encapsulated vitamin C to intra, um, intravenous vitamin C, intravenous vitamin C is great, but gram for gram, Liposome vitamin C is substantially more potent clinically because even when you put it directly into the blood, the vitamin C given IV is not inside the liposome. It's just sitting there floating in the blood. And in order to get into the cell, it's got to consume energy. You're robbing Peter to pay Paul. That's the big difference. Oh, the rest of the liposome is pretty beneficial. We've talked a lot about uh, chemotherapy, and uh, I'll just throw my opinion into the hat, although a lot of people have treated a whole lot more cancer than me. And I'll tell you, and I think this is basically the consensus, and, but you just don't want, well, <laughs> you don't want the vitamin C and the chemotherapy circulating in the bloodstream simultaneously. Unless, of course, your goal is to neutralize the chemotherapy, which is probably a pretty noble goal, too, if, you're, if your true concern is patient outcome. But if you really want the chemotherapy to have its powerful impact, however positive or negative that may be, the chemotherapy is just another toxin. What does vitamin C do to a toxin? It neutralizes it. So you put them into the bloodstream together at the same time, you'll get little or no in effect of the chemo. On the other hand, if you just take it a couple hours before or a couple hours after and let the chemo go where it needs to go, the studies now show by whatever mechanism, a true augmentation of anti-tumor effect combined with an augmentation of patient well-being. So, my vitamin C multi-C protocol is expanded. I talked about this yesterday. I won't spend a lot of time. Oral liposome encapsulated. Taking large amounts of powder. Really, nobody that has a medical condition they will want to treat, no matter how rich they are, how frequently they can get intravenous, how much liposomes they can buy, should not take the simple measure and powerful measure of taking whatever their bowel tolerance dose is of sodium ascorbate in divided doses throughout the day. Because you nuke so much gut toxicity and you keep the immune, cells, the immune cells surrounding your gut fortified with high doses of vitamin C. Remember I said I consider the immune system to be a vitamin C delivery system, okay? Intramuscular, and 
the agents that we're talking about there, uh, I'll just say there'll be more information on my website in about a month. Uh, and while we can't prove definitively that the enzyme mechanism in the liver can be repaired, the results that we're getting would indicate that that's the only logical conclusion. So if you're able to make your own vitamin C, that not only allows you to deal with everything better, but it also brings the management of all your chronic degenerative diseases around. I mean, just think how wonderful it would be to just be hooked up to a low dose vitamin C infusion around the clock 24 seven, okay taking nature's intended remedy for anything. Mop up, uh, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on that, but, but I will say that um, when you're giving lots of vitamin C, you'll oftentimes initiate a detox and the patient will feel worse. Well, when the patient feels worse, a lot of times they're not gonna come back. So you wanna find a way to get them to come back. Even though you know the detox is good for them, they don't feel that way because they feel lousy. What is the best way then to acutely and promptly reverse and stop detox symptoms that were brought on by a sizable dose of vitamin C given at a rapid rate? You treat it with a lower dose of vitamin C given at a lower rate. And it works just fine. Why is that? Because the high rate given rapidly gets inside the cell in high enough volume that it reduces the oxidized detoxification enzymes and starts kicking out lots of toxins out of the cell. But when you slow down the rate, slow down the dose, not as much or very little gets inside the cell and you can just mop up and neutralize the toxins that have been released. And Dr. Ron will tell you this is very effective. Believe me, you want your patient feeling well by the time they leave the office or the clinic or the hospital. Now, that's all sort of good historical stuff. Not the mop up, that's recent. Um, Viral scares, what about them? Well, they're frequently in the press, they're frequently in movies. I mean, we still have movies that want to portend the end of the world when the wrong killer virus gets out there and it's only when the mad scientists get together and find some way to disseminate the magic vaccine that the movie reaches a happy ending. Well, they could reach a happy ending a whole lot quicker with vitamin C. It's actually been published, been published, the article's right there, that ozone with vitamin C quickly and readily and easily cures Ebola. The big, horrible Ebola, okay? Viruses are only as horrible as to the degree to which the person's nutritional and immune status is pathetic, okay? And some of these poor folks in Sierra Leone and elsewhere, they probably have about five antioxidant molecules, only two of which are vitamin C knocking around in their body at any one given point in time because they haven't had a nutritious meal in 20 years. And in fact, in the quote unquote modern populations, there's a substantial incidence of Ebola antibodies, meaning we encounter Ebola along with other viruses, we make our antibodies, and we continue on healthy. What about chikungunya? For those of you who don't know about chikungunya, it's if it doesn't kill you, it makes you more miserable than just about any other virus imaginable. It induces a horrible arthritis, debilitating, to the degree that young people are bedridden, okay? 
Anyway, we have uh, Dr. Marcial Vega here, published a paper from Puerto Rico showing how effective vitamin C and hydrogen peroxide and ozone have resolved chikungunya. Uh, there's an epidemic in Colombia, and I cured my wife with an injection of vitamin C, and I uh, cured her friend with an injection of ozone, so it all works well. Zika, same thing, very easily resolved. Now, vitamin C in any acute viral syndrome. Now I have, I'm going to rapid fire through the end of this stuff here. Uh, and there's a lot of information. I encourage you, if you find it interesting, you can check through the slides and look at the references and get a little more detail. But vitamin C and sepsis, vitamin C and hydrocortisone. Vitamin C and hydrocortisone are the two most significant naturally occurring anti-stress hormones. And even if you don't want to consider vitamin C a hormone, it's a hormone effect for sure. Number one, vitamin C facilitates hydrocortisone effect by reducing an oxidized receptor. And corticosteroids dramatically increase the intracellular uptake of vitamin C. There's some, doc, some, work, some work very recently done by Dr. Honey Hackey and Dr. Miki Rova, not yet published, showing quite elegantly that hydrocortisone massively increases the uptake of vitamin C inside cells. So these are natural co-workers. Now, we have the, yes, we have the initial Marek study that showed 1.5 grams of vitamin C every six hours with 50 grams of hydrocortisone and a little thiamine uh, reduced the mortality rate from 40% to zero in 54 consecutive septic shock patients. More people die in the hospital of septic shock than anything else. So this is not inconsequential by any means. However, in Iran of all places, not exactly the area that I would go look for groundbreaking clinical research, but it is what it is, they found that just giving a similar dose of vitamin C by itself around the clock had the same effect. And the reason for this, I would submit to you, is that Cortisol levels in sepsis are already high. They're already high because what is sepsis? Sepsis is a state of overwhelming infection, oxidative stress. The cortisol receptors are in the cytoplasm, and as you increase the, intracellular ox the intracytoplasmic oxidative stress, you oxidize the glucocorticoid receptors, they become inactive, they can't bind cortisol, and then the body makes more and more and more cortisol to try to compensate. And what happens when you come along with vitamin C by itself? You reduce those receptors, the existing high endogenous cortisol level comes in, binds those receptors, immediately reverses the hemodynamic response of shock, and then the vitamin C kicks in and wipes out the pathogen, and it all works in a couple days. And this was accomplished initially with 1.5 grams of vitamin C every six hours. So not only is this great just from the point of view of learning something new about vitamin C, it's going to be so much easier to sell all of mainstream medicine on vitamin C if we're trying to give them six grams a day rather than 100 grams a day. So, I'm gonna wrap up in a moment. Let me, uh, there's a whole series of, you might enjoy going through this when you have a little more time, but there's a lot of information in the literature 
on the synergy between vitamin C, hydrocortisone, and their effects in sepsis and in other conditions, okay? Some of the animal studies, some of them on people. Uh, the important thing also to remember that Dr. Marek did was when he first worked with this protocol, he had a young woman in septic shock. He was getting ready to leave that night, the ICU. He didn't expect her to be alive the next morning. He'd read a little bit about Klenner. And he said, give him one and a half grams of vitamin C and 50 milligrams of hydrocortisone. Do that every six hours. Well, mind you, if he comes back the next morning, that patient will only have gotten three grams of vitamin C and 100 milligrams of hydrocortisone, nothing else. And he did that, and she was up in bed, eating breakfast, looking fantastic. He did that for 54 cases. He's now up to 700 cases. And I think he said one or two die in spite of the protocol out of 700, okay? If this was a pharmaceutical agent, what do you think the outcry and scream and chest-beating proclamation would be of this new super miracle drug? $80, and we're working on these uh, situations right now at the Reardon Clinic, looking at the evaluation of more frequent vitamin C, devices that can give us a steady infusion of vitamin C. And these were suggestions that were made by Pauling. They were suggestions that was made by Klenner in his papers. They just didn't have really the technology or ability to do it. But even low doses of vitamin C, if you keep a presence in the blood all the time, you're gonna get some very fantastic scenarios. Um, I'll also tell you that we've been playing around, Ron and I, and maybe eventually we can give you some practical protocols, but the lack of IV fluid has pushed us into a new world of vitamin C. And that new world of vitamin C is giving 10, 15, 20 grams of vitamin C, full concentration, IV push with hydrocortisone and sometimes with insulin in the same syringe and it's all done in a couple minutes. And it works fantastically. I'm just not ready to give you formulas yet. I don't want anybody pushing themselves into a hypoglycemic coma. But what did we just say pushes vitamin C inside the cells? Hydrocortisone, insulin. And what do we say is the most important thing therapeutically of any protocol? How much vitamin C can you get inside the cell and lower the increased oxidative stress. So, as the wonderful American philosopher Mark Train once said, whenever you find yourself on the side of the majority, it's time to pause and reflect. <laughs> and finally, it ain't what you don't know that gets you into trouble. It's what you know for sure that just ain't so. Thank you.